Our speaker tonight is Mr. William J. Johnson. He is professor of landscape architecture and head of the Department of Landscape Architecture at uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. They have a very interesting program there. They recently, or at least within the past few years, changed from uh, a housing within the architecture department to a housing in the Department of Conservation, which is a very interesting uh, move, and perhaps Mr. Johnson will tell us a little about that. He has a bachelor's in landscape architecture from Michigan State in 1953, and a master's in landscape architecture from Harvard in 1967. He's done uh, many, many projects, some of which you'll show us tonight, involved in campus planning, in downtown uh, center city core planning, and uh, as well for Frank Ball, whose home is in Muncie, he designed Sugarloaf uh, Mountain Resort up in Michigan. So we're very happy tonight to have Mr. Bill Johnson with us. Bill? Thank you very much. First of all, I want to be sure that I say thank you for coming and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, to be able to say the things that I have in mind to say. I think it's a great privilege to have a group in front of you and uh, the opportunity to say some words. And uh, it always gives me a, a real kick. And uh, I hope that the things that I have brought are meaningful to you and that uh, it will be a worthwhile hour uh, spent in this room. Things are changing so rapidly in my life that I, uh, I find it difficult to, uh, these days, in a professional way, to state convictions. I, uh, I have had... Uh, trouble uh, stating what I believe lately because uh, I suppose I, I think I believe in so many things that uh, I don't know what to sort out and to say that uh, this I really believe and uh, I'm going to try to sort that out tonight and uh, I think it hits fairly close to the things that I think are most important in my professional life I have a couple things in mind. One is I would like to, as I just said, tell you some very fundamental things that I believe. Uh, then I would like to show you some slides about uh, how I operate and my colleagues operate in a professional office. Uh, a few of the projects that uh, we're involved in. And I want to begin by saying that, uh, surely, in view of what is to be done, I have done very little. And uh, the things that I say that I've done, and I'm going to show you these things, I feel a little bit uneasy about because I, I can't help but say, you know, we did this and we've done that and we did this because. And uh, I want to be sure to explain that, although I'm proud of our work, I recognize and uh, see more clearly each day that goes by that the work has many holes, many gaps, and many, many improvements to be made. But I am thankful that I see that. And uh, I think that's the first uh, step that is necessary in doing excellent work, uh, at least as we judge it each day that we look at it and uh, do it. I have three greatest things to talk about, and I just want to mention these briefly, and uh, they may come up again as I show some slides. 
The first one is that the greatest single motivation in my life as a professional is this, and that is to teach and to learn how to respond creatively. And that's important to me, how to respond creatively to circumstance. Whatever that circumstance is, and in my life it happens to be a series of circumstances that I had no control over, and I simply have met this day by day, and, it, and my practice has emerged. That circumstance may be trying to fathom the needs of people as we understand them, trying to respond to problems as we identify them, human problems and, and housing problems and institutional problems that have to do with physical arrangement of functions and use and trying to work them out to be to our satisfaction. And those circumstances may have something to do with just sheer responding to information and data and knowledge. What do we do because of our knowledge? What, what do we do because of facts? And I think that's a very important thing. The meaning of responding creatively may have something to do with process. Uh, we had a session this afternoon in the architecture room, uh, one of the rooms, and I enjoyed that session because I had the opportunity to see uh, some of you as students trying to proceed through the analysis of a problem. I asked if the process of, of an analysis was a creative process. The answer was one that uh, I wasn't surprised at, and I don't criticize it, but the answer was immediately no, that analysis was not a creative process. I believe it is. And I tried to express myself that to respond creatively is a response creatively to even a simple analysis of what the facts are about a problem. And I think there's much more to learn about that than, than we give it credit for. That response creatively to circumstance has something to do with responding to the need for dialogue and conversations. I think we can more creatively converse and talk to each other in new ways and in new uh, dimensions of sincerity, new dimensions of of opportunity and, and uh, action, getting somewhere. And then I think that learning how to respond creatively has something to do with responding to the needs of people. Um, today, this is uh, expressed in many issues of responding creatively to the need that we have as a, as a society. That's my greatest single motivation, to respond creatively to circumstance, and that takes in a lot, but I'm glad that it does. The second greatest I would like to talk about is a greatest shortcoming that I see in achieving effective results from our, our work as professionals. The greatest single shortcoming and this is difficult to describe, but I put it into to this context that I think it is the static nature in our teaching and learning and practice. Static. We tend to do things because we did them yesterday or because uh, we have some preconceived notion of the way things ought to be done or somebody tells us something, and because he's great, then it is good. And uh, I can explain that more, uh, and I know it's, it's quite a, an indictment to, and maybe a challenge, a particular challenge to you, but I think that our teaching and our learning is static, and it ex it's expressed in our practice today. 
And there are some exceptions, but there are not enough exceptions to it. And I would like to, I suppose, express that one a little more. It has to do with the way we plan. And this is, to me, a good example. Most attempts at planning today searches for an answer and gets it one way or another in 18 months or 12 months or whatever the time limit that's preconceived for getting that answer. And darn if it isn't always one answer. Uh, you think about it. When you're given a problem to solve, you come up with one answer. And I know, as an architect, maybe that's important because a building needs a particular commitment at a given time, and you've got to have an answer. One. You can't build three buildings where you're trying to do one. And it's a little difficult to, to think of my comments as a criticism, but I think it is. We don't know how to design and plan in plurality. Administrators don't know really how to respond to plurality in planning, in physical planning. We, we tend to want one answer, and we don't know how to really use six answers all at once, because six might be important. They might be necessary to carry along for a while, because that's the number of options there are. And, uh, in my experience, we don't know how to handle this. And uh, I don't see enough in teaching and learning that I experience, I don't see enough of it in practice of really getting at this one, because I think it's one of the, the real burning issues in our profession today regarding the general future of our countryside throughout our, our nation. Well, I haven't handled that one fully, and uh, there's much more to say on that, but it's one, of, it's one of the greatest shortcomings that I see. The greatest strength that I see in our profession, our professions, and in our, our world of, of artful things, is the uh, almost limitless capacity to dream and to ma imagine a good life, whatever you want to call a good life. You, you, put the, you explain the good life, but it has to do with what your convictions are. And uh, I don't think that there is any question in my mind that that is my greatest opportunity, my greatest strength, because I think in ideas, they are still the fundamental product of a profession, of mine and yours. And I think that uh, I have experienced, without question, the fact that ideas can change lives, can change situations beyond our, our willingness to, to believe it. And I've watched people change because an idea was introduced. And I've watched, in simple ways, I suppose, money occur because of an idea, not because of a demand. And I've watched things happen and because an idea came and it happened differently because of that idea. And uh, I don't think any kinds of talk about process or problem-solving techniques or uh, uh, data banks or the product as a building is, uh, is as important as this one thing. And I think in our day and age it's easy to get lost in the things that are other than the idea that you're searching for and the creativity that it takes in terms of training and learning and spending our time in this building to learn to be a professional. I think it's a terribly creative field or an opportunity for it. And uh, we, we don't want to lose that fundamental focus uh, in our professions. Those are my three greatest <laughs> problems, I suppose. And uh, that's, at the moment, what I believe about them. One other note before I show these slides. I uh, have 
been aware of the opportunity here for Department of Landscape Architecture. And uh, I'm, I'm all for it and I, I just wish you the best of luck in bringing this about. I, I think it's a, a wonderful field, one that needs new dimensions. It needs this, the brightest people and the sharpest people that can be found. And uh, in my uh, brief career, I've had the opportunity to uh, go from school to school on our professional accrediting committee <coughs> and look at schools and programs of landscape architecture throughout the country. I think I've seen everyone that's accredited. And I've been able to be close enough to to have some opinions about its worth and uh, effect. And I've come surely to, to this conclusion that there is no one way to organize a program that you can call best and prove it. There is opportunity in every, every setup that I've seen, and they're different. And uh, I think there's probably always a better way but I think in the end, you, you, you just can't seem to uh, find a single note of uh, concurrence on the way a program ought to be set up in t teaching and learning today. And I'm glad of it. And I just urge you and, and, and uh, wish that you can proceed as firmly as you see it today. And don't be bothered by many other ideas that are also good, but develop this one particularly good. I'm sorry, John. Lancius is not here tonight or today. He's ill. And uh, I'm just sure that uh, the way he sees it is valid for today, and it should be done excellently to the best possible ability. And, and then my advice is to proceed with a program that can always take new form. Uh, that would be the most uh, important kind of program. Now, I'm going to show a few things that uh, we've been involved with just to give maybe a new dimension, maybe not, maybe it's just some more uh, uh, recognition of some of the things that landscape architects do. Uh, let me have the lights out and the slides and I'll try to go through these as quickly as possible. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. I was waiting on some. This uh, particular slide, uh, let me turn this slide out. Get it in focus here. We missed uh, a little bit on the sequence of these slides, but I'll, I'll proceed from here. Uh, this particular project is a project in uh, Canton, Ohio. Uh, focused around the development of a central square. Now, Canton is a community that uh, had the good fortune of had, having a little broader area downtown, at least in the center of the city, than most. And uh, you'll notice that uh, this particular view uh, shows Four lanes of traffic, two lanes of parking, and four lanes of traffic, and broad sidewalks on both sides. Very broad. And it was called for many years, and still is, the so Wine Island Public Square. And uh, this is the center of the city with the, a major cross section here. And that wide portion was two blocks long. And then further to the north and south, the street narrowed down into a smaller dimension that's more typical of our Midwestern cities. Uh, in Canton, 
<coughs> the effort focused upon a local endeavor to bring about something fresh and new regarding this public square. And this is the result of uh, two years of very uh, careful and dogged uh, effort at doing something of significance in this downtown area. It was very drab before, and today there is a, a very alive kind of development in this two block area. I don't represent this project as being uh, one that has caused all kinds of new things in the area, but it seems to occur concurrently with many new buildings and many new things that are happening in the downtown center. And as you know, uh, as well as I, the downtown areas of our, of our country, our cities across the country are experiencing extreme uh, difficulty in, in uh, bringing about a real solid kind of development. Let me go on and show you a little bit how this was done. Uh, the city street, as it occurs, as, as it occurred before, was of this sort. Notice the parking in the middle of the street. That's not on the side. It's in the middle. And then there are four lanes of, of traffic through. A very uh, uh, car-oriented area and difficult for people to really find a, a sense of belonging in this particular area for shopping or going to the city hall or whatever else would bring them downtown. We had at our disposal of this very brief study uh, the result of a market study and a basic traffic count study that was done by a New York firm. And the essence of the land use was uh, like this, out of that report. There were so many uh, blocks so much area of business and retail. Uh, a civic center was noted to this uh, north edge of the downtown center, which is red. Uh, a medical center was thought about, although I don't think this is yet appeared, in this edge of town. Uh, institutional here, a school, a government center, this uh, is the government center. There are some new uh, buildings in this area. And the city hall began as the public square project began. Uh, on this edge was uh, general commercial in the light blue and uh, backed up by warehousing in this central city area. The dash lines represent the two, two uh, main streets in the city and they converge in this particular zone of public square. In order to decrease the need for those eight lanes of traffic through the center of town, uh, quite an effort was made to identify ways and means of nudging the traffic off of that center. Uh, not to necessarily eliminate it at first, but to decrease the need for it as a major traffic flow. So there were a number of key zones that were found in needing new breakthroughs in traffic circulation possibilities. And uh, fortunately, uh, I, as I understand it, these have all occurred now. And uh, at the time that the public square project went along, I don't think any of them had actually been started. Uh, but the opportunity was so realistic that uh, I suppose uh, enough faith in the fact that this could be done, uh, why it was the first uh, measure in getting it done. The effort that we went through was to take that context that I just showed you and uh, look at the center city in a little more detail as far as potential goes. Uh, this is a small portion showing the two block public square zone. A small portion of a very large plan that was done, much as you would do it in, in terms of trying to identify stores, uh, buildings that, that wouldn't last long, buildings that were very solid, trying to find possible breakthroughs, zones for new bu buildings, 
parking structure zones, and uh, we did a character study of the entire center city, and uh, hit upon the center block as a possible development. So we refined this particular plan a little more and came up with a cause. Um, the essence of this plan is to keep traffic going through on both streets, but limit it to two lanes moving here, this would be in the south direction, and to the north, two lanes moving here. And uh, then keeping this avenue entirely as it was, and its full lineage, it was needed. Then to develop it almost as if we were ignoring that automobile traffic, and develop it as you'd want it for people. And then the automobiles will be accommodated for the buses and taxis and the small local drop offs that are needed, and let the car seem to be an intruder, let it be there. And uh, we felt that this would work. And in working on the plan for the public square, just in this two block zone, we felt that the center area ought to be the largest zone and treat it as a plaza or a square. And this would be treated off into uh, concrete divisions with zones of brick paving and to give it more of a treatment that the people would walk on than for cars, and then a building and a building to delineate two smaller plazas, one to the north and one to the south. This building we thought of as a, an art center, art display area, and this area as an art plaza, so the display of art and sculpture, fountains, and whatever. And this particular area, a small uh, snack bar, it turned out that it was something that the uh, Chamber of Commerce had could use it as an office and uh, uh, also as a uh, warming house for a winter ice skating rink and a summer restaurant club in the middle of the And that was basically the scene with some notions about uh, some details that I'll show you. There are a number of sketches uh, drawn up in pencil, fairly quick character sketches of some of the characteristics of the scheme and how we proceed. We needed to identify some details to get some cost impressions. This shows some of the existing buildings here and some notions about the uh, breakthrough of a back block area and uh, the uh, winter ice skating, the buses going through, and uh, some new trees and uh, sitting areas and bringing about a human touch to the center city. This was a sketch uh, showing how that might occur from a, above, from the buildings that are around it. We developed a, a model, uh, worked with then, uh, introduced uh, the problem of, of architecture to some uh, very talented people in Birmingham, Michigan, and we worked together on the two structures, and they turned out to be uh, in this particular form and uh, detail. Through a great deal of, of effort on part of the private citizenry, and uh, many long nights in, in general public hearings on the plans and the problems, and the expenses, the project began, and uh, we were almost uh, surprised <laughs> that it started. It was quite a shock to see them uh, begin. And uh, I, I'll never forget how the city engineers uh, suddenly ran to this area and began to chart uh, long lost sewers and, and water lines and manholes and, and all. They're delighted to find this information out, and uh, the thing proceeded, and ended up with uh, this being the the uh, warming house, the office area for a chamber, kind of a, um, a welcoming area for strangers. Uh, this is in the center of that plaza. This is the old uh, restaurant area, snack bar, really for light lunches, 
it uh, has uh, heat, freezing elements in order to freeze for winter ice cream. This is a crosswalk. Uh, the, uh, the main intersection where the two streets cross is right here. It looks like a plaza for people. It doesn't look like cars are usually along there. And yet they do come through and there are traffic lights for control and all that. Uh, this is the art building and the display center on the other side. I think that in essence this was a minimum kind of project. Uh, it turned out to be very minimum in, in, minimum in cost. Uh, we can't talk dollars anymore because they don't mean much anymore when you talk dollars. But this was uh, extremely limited, uh, less than half a million dollars for the entire total project. Um, this is a typical scene of, of some of the shots that are there and the overhead trees. I think it looks like a new world and it did as it uh, emerged. This is a typical cross. See, this is the main cross center. This is where the cars cross the main center. These are placed in order to protect pedestrians as they cross here. And uh, they just wander through these, but it's, it's a protected area for, from the automobiles which will buy here. So we, we did get rid of the curves that so often we, this is where cars are, like this. And in the center area, we've got rid of the curves. And uh, it helps a lot to bring people uh, more uh, uh, easily into areas if there are not these uh, the curves that mean automobiles. Uh, this is the uh, art display area in the art center itself. And you can see there's two lanes going by and uh, no parking, but over here, this is the intersection again, and the uh, uh, restaurant, the side bar, and the uh, bar. This was an extremely uh, desolate area, and this has helped a lot. Uh, notice the county building in the background. I think a new kind of beauty was discovered in this old building, and uh, I don't know what has happened recently, but I know at the time that many people uh, discovered this old building in the, in the uh, uh, public square and uh, thought, well, gee, you know, what a great building. But I've never said that before. And a little bit of, of uh, care in the telephone company's uh, new, at that time, new uh, telephone booth. And the ice skating actually in process. It's right downtown, center of the city. Parade. Now I'd like to move to another simple project like the one you just saw. This is one is in Ann Arbor. And it's a small part of a 10-point action program that was outlined in 1965 after two years of study in a general plan downtown. This is the center business area for Ann Arbor in this area. If you're familiar with Ann Arbor, the campus is out in this direction. North is up, and this is Main Street. These dark lines represent major traffic movement, and uh, the two traffic was handled on these dark lines. The lighter lines are minor traffic movements, and where you see gaps are zones that we thought could be streets eventually uh, taken away and used for malls, as you're familiar with. Uh, so this was the central area that could be made free of traffic. Uh, these two dotted lines were essential to the decreasing of traffic or the eventual elimination of traffic on Main Street. Uh, these have not been accomplished yet, although these two major moves have been costed out. They seem to be uh, part of a realistic uh, five-year program of uh, capital outlay 
and uh, it seems to be one of the last of the ten points that was outlined to be accomplished, and this is one of the last moves in it. I think it's imminent in the community now. But all I want to show you is how the first stage of a piece of a mall was done in this three block area of Main Street. Just a piece of it. The uh, scheme, and uh, I laid this on the side, from one block, the second block, and the third block. These two blocks, and the front blocks, and this block being a long one approximately four of Ann Arbor's blocks. And uh, the idea was to uh, take one side of one block and eliminate the parking and use that parking area, which was parallel parking, for a new kind of sidewalk. The opposite side in the next block would be done similarly, and the opposite side in the next block would be done similarly mainly to get a, a prominent introduction of the character that we wanted to see in the downtown area of Ann Arbor. The other side, in the yellow line, would continue to be parallel parking as it, as it was. This was taken to the merchants along the way. Uh, incidentally, I wanted to show you this particular uh, drawing, which shows that three block area and all of these little lines, and you can't see them individually, but there's a maze of little lines that mean water, sewer, or some other kind of obstruction, <laughs> all adding up to the likelihood that this would not be even possible. And it was amazing what, a, what a, uh, an obstruction this was, the very idea of digging into Main Street. And it is true, it, it is a, a maze and these are the only ones that could be identified. We never knew exactly what we'd find if we started in. But uh, the idea of going from one side to the other with the improvement was taken to the merchants, and they uh, responded in a, uh, I think in a normal kind of questioning way, wondering if this would really be an expenditure worthwhile or what it would bring them in terms of business, and that's a realistic question. And uh, it was a funny thing that they didn't want the alternate treatment. They wanted it on both sides. And so what we did then, we, in that the balance of, we had eliminated half the parking in the first proposal. So then we went back and, and kept that same ratio, but divided it between the sides. Kept parking, uh, kept the same parking measure of the first plan, that is half the cars, and kept uh, the lanes of traffic. There's no, no fewer lanes here than before, and this is three lanes. Uh, I think we shifted from four lanes, actually, but didn't narrow the road. They wanted, the traffic plan wanted three lanes for some particular reason, instead of four, uh, and these were broader lanes. And the idea was to simply come in with, with two or three uh, very substantial containers, uh, making sure that the trees could grow, making sure that we watered them, and making sure that any detail that was put in was substantial, well-designed, and looks like it was meant to be there. Nothing temporary. Now, I show this to show the full treatment of the wall. What we had uh, supposed to be done for a while, see these thick trees, we simply, at some time, someday in the future, uh, add the three center ones here, and we move into a full mall. It's an option. We may not need it. We may not want it. There may be some great advantage in having the cars there that we, we suspect might be there, but we're not sure about. But it's an option. And I want to show you then just a few slides of this was the way it was before. Uh, a good shopping area, one that was fundamentally clean, but uh, the cars were very close to the sidewalk. It was the typical uh, 
environment for shopping that no one can put their finger on it, but they don't like it. And you say it's because of the cars. Well, there's cars in our scheme. Uh, maybe it's because of the narrow sidewalk. Well, our sidewalk isn't any wider. Maybe it's because of the signs. Well, the signs didn't change in our scheme. Maybe it's because of some of the bad buildings. Well, the buildings didn't change in our scheme. But the environment changed when we finished. So we're beginning to put our fingers on the elements that were important to changing a place, making it different and more attractive. This is a sketch in the same area showing the narrower street, the, the uh, planting portion in the center, and the larger trees, and a little bit of treatment by that parking lot. And some attention to signs. This was a typical corner uh, of that shopping area. You can see, you can count four lanes of traffic, very tight lanes, very uh, inviting to damage to cars, or a lot of little touch and go action, and then the narrow sidewalks on both sides. And uh, uh, an after sketch for the proposal to give it some dimension, some reality, for people who couldn't really find uh, reality and plans. The project began after uh, financing and that took a, a real effort and I give all the credit to local determination to do it. Uh, and I, I say again, this was minimum funds, minimum funds. I can't overemphasize that. We struggled and struggled to spend a dollar where they counted. This is a, uh, a concrete drinking uh, uh, fountain with a stainless steel inlet and uh, cup. And then these are the substantial planting areas, eight by eight, interior dimension, with a one foot. We wanted these broader, but we had to narrow it down to one foot. And, and if they were one inch less than a foot, we were going to say, let's not do it, because we're getting down to some dimensions that are critical in making this thing solid and feel good and right and the place to sit. If we can't have it that wide, then we're getting into a critical uh, touch and go situation. Some of the benches that were used, we wanted benches that could be sat upon from four sides and, and not a, a real resting place with a back because of the only moments that people do sit here, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, but uh, rarely a half an hour. Uh, the box is beginning to become brick in between. Some portions of the sidewalk were new. We were faced with a serious drainage problem because the crown of the street was higher than the curb, and the, cur and the place of the sidewalk at the buildings was higher than that. So that the only way we could possibly drain is to drain from the curb into the sidewalk and have a series of little inlets along the way. It gave us fit on this uh, drainage, effective drainage of that little sidewalk. But this is the stuff that makes things work. And I think that if, if we weren't able to get down and solve these little problems, it would have killed the, uh, the realism of this particular little project. And this is the beginning of it, uh, just as it was finished. You'll notice the uh, strong guy wires. There was water led into each box. We didn't want to go on unless there was water directly into each box, because we know that if plants don't grow, then you might as well forget them. And they've got to be healthy. This is the uh, project as it was recently done, finished. Uh, Tree, the box, uh, the geraniums that were added by the city, but uh, this has changed. The people have redone these things, and they're really gloriously uh, done. Here's a new uh, telephone uh, box, and this is a new restaurant that uh, used an old building. Uh, this was the first fall for these trees. They were fairly big. We paid a lot of money for these, but we didn't have a lot of them. And we knew that we had to have an effect that uh, was substantial. They were guaranteed to grow. And uh, only one died of uh, a couple dozen, and uh, it was replaced. This is what's happening on this delightful little street. 
the traffic is essentially unchanged. A little bit different pattern. These are parking zones. Every occasional area, every other so often, there's, there's three cars, and then a similar length, and then three cars again. Occasionally they do this, and uh, it's really delightful. The trees are now shedding some real shade. They've been in three years. And it's amazing to me the way people come and sit here. They come down on a nice evening and, and actually stroll. I didn't think they would, really. Uh, and they're beginning to do some things that are personal touches. I think this is minimum. I think it's the kind of stuff that uh, you scoff at and say, well, that's not a big plan, but it's a part of one, and it's there. And the next time you say, we've got an idea, uh, I don't think people are going to turn you off so easily. Some of the projects that landscape architects get involved in are almost like buildings. Uh, very demanding, literal kind of, of accomplishments. And uh, this one I want to show quickly a development for the Milwaukee War Memorial Center in, in the center city of Milwaukee. The center, the main commercial avenue is this one, Wisconsin. And then this is Lake Michigan. And where the center of the city really touches uh, Lake Michigan is in this particular area. There's no other opportunity. This is all uh, industrial development this way, and the other way is a general park and marina. And this is a critical area. And a building done by um, Sarney uh, and Inn, and uh, an outstanding bit of architecture. It occurs at the end of an old bridge. Our job was to see what future potential this site had for finishing it out, becoming a more uh, a, a, a program of effort that was more recreational, with more recreational potential, as well as the art center as an expansion. And then tying effectively back into the city core as the heart of the center city. This was not the uh, true with the present development. And at the same time, to accommodate between the present uh, indictment here, to accommodate a new expressway, uh, eight lanes, and also a new parkway. It's a new uh, development, it's a typical kind of issue that we confront constantly along Lake Michigan's uh, urban zones. So we, we got at it, uh, we worked closely with engineers highway engineers and uh, the project architect who worked with Saarinen on the War Memorial Center to develop a new scheme. Um, the first slide I showed you is some uh, analysis of the situation and we responded to that situation by coming up with several schemes. This was the preliminary, very rough sketch of, a, of an idea that uh, did come about as a, an idea that we went further with and developed. This is the finished site plan. I show you this mainly because I wanted to show you how we do get involved in projects that are very specific, very programmed, very tight budgeting, and very uh, prominent kind of architectonic uh, involvement. Uh, there is a lot to this scheme that I'd like to go through, but I won't have the the chance for really. this, this is the present building. It's expanded in function, basically underground, and uh, reaching out to two large farms that provide a huge amphitheater that has the potential for being a smaller amphitheater here, and providing some new uh, pedestrian crossovers of the expressway that goes by, a brand new bridge, it's a pedestrian bridge rather than traffic, and a linkage, a park linkage, kind of an urban park, over to the center of Wisconsin Avenue which it, with which it uh, joins. A few sketches. This was the little park that led up. It came up with a, a new curb dimension, a very high curb, and uh, letting the bank slope in away from the traffic, giving some protection uh, 
as, as the, the walk parallel with the traffic, and then uh, about the design of New Bridge, and the engineers have responded very faithfully, really, to the notions that uh, we've worked with, uh, very carefully have worked with protecting the views of the Lake Michigan horizon from the uh, urban area of love on the bank, and uh, we've had to work planting out quite carefully and uh, develop some notions on plant materials and uh, planting in bridges and walls. A very, probably a very traditional kind of uh, intense landscape problem. Another kind of involvement is new community development. This particular project, uh, we're, we became involved with, with the developer of a new community on this island uh, just off of Montreal in Canada. This is called Nuns Island. Uh, this, we were approached and worked out a, a working procedure with the developers in <coughs> oh, about three years ago and uh, worked out some early notions of plan which developed into this basic idea. This was done in chalk, a very basic notion, but it was fairly carefully programmed in terms of use, uh, uh, a balance of, of income potential, and uh, very definitely related to Montreal as, as kind of a bedroom community, and uh, some commercial development, but mainly housing and recreation. Uh, we went further with notions on these communities, smaller groups of communities uh, worked very closely with uh, architects. We had to uh, put 80% of the parking under roof of some kind or other. 20% could be open. This is because of the rough Canadian winters. And uh, began to uh, come out with a, a reality. Uh, this was a particular problem because of the, the very uh, complicated kind of uh, traffic movement left large areas of unused land. Uh, we were studying here the potential of some of these unused land areas, or, or they're dead if you don't watch it. And uh, so we even expanded the interchange, made it broader so that possibly uses could come within it. And uh, this was a toll point because of the uh, uh, need to offset the cost of the new construction and bridges. These are some sketches of river edge possibilities, the characteristics of the housing, some of the open space dimensions, some of the tighter ones, the town housing, and uh, worked out a scheme for the first area and began to zero in on actual development. Uh, many models, many sessions, many arguments, many uh, I quit sessions. <laughs> you know, if I don't. <laughs> and uh, we, it, it's being built and we're just uh, pleased to be involved. And this was uh, Nice and this was the structure here. He also, or the office developed a, a gasoline station too, which is then published. And uh, these are the townhouses, pretty much according to some of the goals we set out for to, uh, to achieve. And uh, really quite a rewarding effort at creating a, a new environment for people. I, I don't know as you could say that this was great or, you know, the best, but I think it's been rewarding because we've been able to start with goals. We watched goals become realities and uh, we've watched developers nod their heads at least in basic approval of the kind of reality or, or income reality that these projects have had too. And it's a tough balance, one that has to be fought hard to, to make possible the uh, reality of these goals. It's fresh, it's just in. I think it, it hasn't quite gathered any patina of use or or comfortableness that's complete yet. 
where we worked very closely with this. We had to put a sign on every tree that we wanted. I prepared, prepared a sign in French and English. <laughs> That's right. That, that threatened the, uh, the bulldozer drivers. <laughs> and, actually, and then we had to go and really enforce it. This is another community that's in the process, a very different kind of job. This is not at all the privilege of, of working with one client. This is a, a community of Gross Eel Township in Michigan. It's in the Detroit River. It doesn't flow here, but there's a river edge on both sides that you can't see. And this is the island. It's three or four miles long. Uh, a naval air station here. And uh, an analysis of some of the open spaces here, the vegetation, and natural habitat areas for birds. This was a major element to wildlife. And it became uh, a, a real issue with people who live here. This happens to be a prominent flyover for many, many species of, of increasingly rare birds. <laughs> I didn't know, but what uh, that was a relatively unimportant thing, but boy, we, we, we've got birds in this scheme, I tell you. They, <laughs> people love their birds, and I, I, I buy that. Uh, land form, uh, basically low. This brighter area here is about 30 feet above the water level. The dark area is right at the water level, quite low almost in the water. Uh, very difficult to work with because where you could want where you where you'd want to shape the land into new water areas, uh, two feet below the muck was rock. So you, you couldn't you can't choose in an offhanded way where a, where a marina ought to be. You have to find the area that is possible for a marina and then see if you wanted it. Uh, some other bits of analysis of uh, existing development. Moving into a preliminary development of a scheme, and this is uh, 701 planning money, and the red tape and the procedures and the difficulty of being creative in these kinds of planning programs are very difficult. And I think uh, this is a real test in my mind of one's patience and, and uh, strength of, of stick to itiveness to come through with some creative plans in the, some of these government programs, but I think it's possible. And uh, we're moving into a scheme now that is built up of many, many, many givens. And the opportunities for, for flexibility are very little, actually. Uh, for instance, here is a very little after it was all over. They took out an area that was one of the few spots for a marina. And this is one of the characteristics of this island, is, is water sports and water activity. Yet a, a jet field comes in and takes one spot where you can do it. And uh, we're working now on the potentials of this new community uh, in the center of the island. This is very carefully balanced out with a program of uses that seems to be appropriate in terms of market, in terms of uh, the general plan of Detroit as a region, and uh, it's becoming exciting. What was planning has become creative, exciting ideas, and I think it's uh, a wonderful thing. <coughs> now, moving into another kind of project, this one involves the planning of a, the central campus in Ann Arbor for the University of Michigan. Campus planning has been a large activity in our firm. 30% or more is the campus planning activity. And uh, this particular project was the first professional planning project that I was involved with. And uh, I still show up because I'm particularly pleased with one thing. The plan that I developed in 1961 for the University of Michigan is still 
as, as real and legitimate and, uh, and valid as the day it was done in 1961. And I tried to do that very badly because the university asked that this be one of the qualities, if we could possibly work it in, was a sorting out of, of goals to the point where we could physically stay with some goals for some time. And I, I wanted to show you this because of that reason. That last slide was, was Ann Arbor. Let me go back to that. I don't know why I didn't say anything about that. Uh, this is the expressway system around Ann Arbor today. Uh, the orange is university property. From the athletic area, the stadium right here, to the central campus, to the medical center, to the North Campus, and all throughout here is the city of Ann Arbor. And the, the river valley comes through in the middle, you can see the low area, and then the higher areas in Ann Arbor are the darker green. So you can see how central the university is, you can see how the river valley plays such an important part in the future of both the university and the city in terms of being central to it. This has turned out to be quite a, a burning issue in the community. This is an old view, sketch, drawing of the first 40 acres of the University of Michigan. Uh, I want you to notice the diagonal off system beginning to form. Probably came on, I understand that this was a pasture for many years during the operation of the university. And the uh, actual cattle were kept in the uh, 48. <laughs> 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 Unless that's meaningful. And um, maybe these are compact, I don't know. I like to think they were. And then the center of the city is over here. This is the area where we just showed the, the Main Street in Auburn. And uh, a building that we have just purchased for an office and are redeveloping. Right there, built in 1864. And we're kind of proud of that. At, at any rate, this was the center of the city, and here was a little old University of Michigan on the edge of the city. This is no longer true, and that's a classic story of every university in the world, I suppose. Today, uh, Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan are inseparable. Uh, Ann Arbor is often referred to as Ann Arbor, uh, as the University of Michigan. It's almost synonymous because of this indistinguishable character of, of where the university is and where the city is. It has caused some real wonderful qualities at the University of Michigan. It has caused some extremely difficult problems with community relations. I just want to show you a just a few of the graphics, just to go through some of the thoughts. Uh, <coughs> this is a picture around the central campus of the housing in yellow. This is housing. This is where the university counts so much on faculty and, and student housing, is in the homes of the private area all around. Uh, the black areas are dormitories that have been developed and uh, relatively very few, actually, because of the close community time. Uh, just a quick view of the central campus. This is the original 40 acres. The diagonal walk system has become a major feature of the campus, as you saw it in that old picture. It has become prominent today. And the red here is the liberal arts program of use. You can see how central they are to the central campus. And then the professional schools are traditionally really, this is typical in so many ways, are grouped around that old central area of the liberal arts basic uh, program. The medical center is off to the top of the sheet. And uh, this is a five minute walking radius. It's like a line. Very tight, very tight complex uh, campus. Uh, I'm just showing you a few scattered uh, thoughts here. The traffic turned out to be 
uh, one of trying to get around it as much as possible uh, on the edges. And these black lines represent the need to improve certain streets. This has been done, and uh, I would say that the University of Michigan has accomplished most of our basic goals today. Uh, 1961 to 69 in uh, that period of time. But this was the notion, and this has been basically accomplished. It was a goal. Parking, we, in, in developing the density capacity, the capacity for the campus to accommodate enrollment increases, we found that in balance with keeping the parking in accommodating staff and faculty and uh, the street system, we found that in the long range future, the campus could take about a third more growth, an increase of approximately a third, without changing character, without going to higher buildings as such, as an average, or without changing the fundamental character of what it is today. With a major change, it could increase above that. But we said 30% increase was the it was the maximum without major changes. We identified the two structures we were in at the time, three structures were in. No, I'm sorry. Two structures were in. These two parking structures. Uh, this one came later. This is a city structure. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This one did come later. This, was a, this became a city parking structure for the little business area here. Uh, these were proposed structures and certain, certain volumes to accommodate the potential of new growth in these various campus zones. And uh, this has been accomplished today. This is the last structure right here. These have all been built. This is the last one to be built, and it's uh, uh, in negotiation now with the city in terms of closing a street and going. This is one of them that was built in accordance with this general scheme of parking structure on the edge of the campus. And you move in with uh, uh, commodious walkways into the campus and join into that uh, diagonal wall system. This parking lot has been removed. It is now a new plaza and a new administration building that was built at this point. Uh, in accordance generally with the goals of the scheme. I want to point out this walk system again because here I think was a very simple factor, very simple everyday factor that became to me one of the more prominent leading characteristics to proposing future growth. The walkway system, in terms of general volume and associated here with the width, the, wide, the heavily used walks very wide and the lightly used walks very narrow. You can see the, even today, the holding of that fundamental crisscross pattern. It's clear and it's simple. And uh, this, I think, we should jump on. When we find something that is clear, it is simple, we ought to latch on to it if it's that natural. Because that's one of the difficult things we have with planning, is to bring out clarity and simplicity in planning. We searched for it, and here it was existing. So we thought that this was a major thing that the university should try to interpret if it can. And we tried to begin that interpretation. These are the kinds of walks. Widen to several kinds, and probably needing three or four more widen. So this is, is meaningful too. The first expression of this began in this building. It was conceived during the process of our work, and the concept it responded really to the thought that our walkways ought to be built on. Rather built next to or alongside us. They ought to be built upon because it's, it's within the buildings that we can begin to control environment and uh, it's, it's within the buildings that you begin to do something about entering a building rather than setting the building off to be entered through a great portico. So, this is the first expression of it. This is on the campus edge. Was done, this was done uh, four or five years ago. And this particular opening was purposely put here because this is one of those broad white lines that goes along 
along this building, really part of it, and that's where we say a new kind of extension, a new, uh, the greatest possibility for development seems to be along that line, not over there two blocks or over there four blocks, but right here. And I think extension into the community in a narrow sector is more valid than broadening the university out on all of its edges. It's more flexible. We can leap around a little bit more according to circumstance and opportunity. To me, that was a very meaningful thing. This is not supposed to be the last slide. Oh, oh, I guess it was. Oh, I'm sorry. I think there's only a couple more slides, and uh, that I think is the end, I hope. Yes, our uh, basic theme is summed up here. This is our plan. This is our, these are our recommendations for the future of the university. We, we want to identify, if we can, and express in our details of buildings and plans and walkways and signs and whatever else we can think of as a campus, part of our campus scene, we'd like to express uh, at least five identifiable sub-areas of the campus. We can see them now. They're not identifiable physically very well at all, but they're socially identifiable and, and functionally identifiable. And uh, aside from the central 40 acres, there were these five centers that we wanted to stress. Not the edges so much, but the centers. And uh, remember the slide that showed the parking structure? And I said a new building, a new administration building, and a new plaza. That has been done right there. And I, I think it's one of the pleasing kinds of decisions that came out for me. In, in not, not the way we outlined it in detail, but basically according to this scheme. That was the decision. This is going to be true, and this is going to be true, and this is being true now because this occurs on top of a structure parking structure, which has been lowered into this valley over here. This is coming through now. This street is going to be closed. And this is going to come about relatively soon again. I think it's beginning to take on an order that is not prescribed or imposed upon that campus, but simply came out of what's happening. And if we can be sharp enough to begin to look at the way things are and to interpret them into our dreams and thinking about ideas, I think they'll be more possible because they're already happening in a way. We only simply will have to nudge them and they become great ideas because they're real and they're what people are today. Well, we've made a number of schemes, a number of expressions of these thoughts. Uh, we didn't put much stock in them because they began to be almost too literal. Um, they became better as studies. Now we drew this up as an expression of that diagram. But I say today, and I knew it, I felt it at the time, that this was irrelevant. This scheme should have been drawn. It took uh, maybe 25% of our money to develop that scheme. And it's, uh, it should have been done quicker and, and in, in more fuzzy terms and as notions. It should have been done in six diagrams. Not that one scene, because it, it isn't the one that we look at all the time. We're looking back at that. Here's the, here's the meaningful one today. It's been meaningful for six years. And uh, these are not meaningful, because they're not, we can't predict the way in which they will take quite their shape or form. They're good as exercises, and they're good as expressing and interpreting and articulating some thoughts. But uh, we can't depend on these precise single plans as we have done in the past so much. Uh, this is a little more sophisticated expression of that funny little diagram three or four slides back. It shows it in a little more detail of what the notions are. It shows the walkways, uh, in my mind, could become almost all architecture. Cover the, the walks, change the concepts of first floor space, if it's, a, if it's a classroom building, and the first floor doesn't have to be a classroom, 
to society, you know, they, the first four doesn't have to be a class. We would ought to become more socially respond, uh, 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 response to the needs of the, of the campus. I think this is something else the university is doing. As a, as a response, the university built the library. It's, it's almost done now, over the sidewalk. And the building becomes a passageway. It's protected from some of the elements. And it's an entrance to the library well. And uh, not only got a building on the site, but we got a new, new kind of walkway. I don't think the, uh, the expenditure has been much to gain a new kind of, of land. And just a couple notes on one detail. After that scheme, for the last six years, we've been working daily with the university on various little things. Uh, walkways. We, we needed much more attention to the way in which people circulate. We did a major study, uh, not a major study, but a particular report on just walkways. And uh, you think that that's something you can't make much of, but a walkway study became very real and, and a lot to it. And we've got some real goals in terms of the building of new walkways. This is science, and uh, this was a first notion of of some of the campus areas getting special uh, symbolic identification. And we worked out uh, some signs. We're working with them now, trying to get a better, more simple, uh, and more uh, small, really, expression of where things are in the university uh, campus areas. And these are under experimentation now. This is up now. They're being tested. Okay, we can have the lights here. I want to mention one last project, or kind of project, and that is in this, these two documents. It involves Chicago, and this particular document says a study on the future of Chicago's lakefront. And this particular document is called Jackson Park. This is the context for the study of Jackson Park. Some of you may know of the issue, but the Jackson Park was a, a, a historically a, a beautiful thing for Chicago, a great attribute. But an expressway, which is the Lakeshore Drive, uh, has got to come through the park. And as some of you know, the ladies and some of the gentlemen chained themselves to the trees as the project began. And they were literally lifted up, and the trees were cut, and they were lowered to the ground with people on them. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, the citizens were fairly concerned. <laughs> about this roadway. And uh, the pressure did mount, and uh, Mayor Daly had to stop the project. It was uh, a third completed in eight lanes, some of the park gone. And uh, through some circumstances, I became involved a bit, and uh, we were asked in three months to see if we could solve this. <laughs> And I said, fine, you know, <laughs> probably shouldn't have done that. But I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, we started studying some alternatives. We had a three-month deadline. And in some preliminary notions about the general idea of what the lakefront ought to be, which I did in a great hurry, I began to see various possibilities in the park for this roadway. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget this project because it has been as meaningful to me as that first campus was in 1960 for me. Because it, it, would, it marked a similar kind of turning point in my attitudes about planning and design. That uh, here were people literally crying about their plight. And they were that concerned. Now, you don't have to say that they're right or wrong, but they were th that concerned. They were there. And uh, the meetings were extremely emotional. And yet, 
I felt very strongly that there's probably some kind of a, a creative answer to it. I didn't know what, but I, I did have the confidence that in a short time we could come up with some notions about, uh, you call it a compromise, I call it a resolution. And uh, in three months, to the day, uh, we had a report, this report, on the desk in Chicago, recommending a specific program for the solution of the problem. It, it may not be resolved in the end, I don't know. Uh, there have been some powerful repercussions of, of expenditures that are being made now because of this report. And it seems to be heading in the right direction. But I'll never forget the day that those ladies came up to me after the presentation, the final presentation in Chicago, uh, with tears in their eyes. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I didn't know whether to join them or not. Uh, they said they couldn't believe that there was any possible uh, professional set of goals that could be determined as positive if that roadway went through the park. And yet there was. There was. It was a very simple scheme, really. It was the recognition of two kinds of parks that Jackson Park was. That was all. Jackson Park wasn't one park. It was two parks. It was a park that had to do with the water, and it was a park that had to do with the community. And socially, this was, this was literally true. And it could be proven. It was proven with photographs and interviews. And the roadway simply split the two parks. That they were already split socially and physically. The roadway wasn't harming anything. It was only expressing and, and uh, coming through where division already was. And the, the nature of how it came through was a design problem. That's where you get into some of the things about how skillful you can deal with some embankments and screening and trees and bridges and overpasses and underpasses. That's technical more. But the, the concept was there and it was very simple. And it came out of the situation. And I wish we could, as teachers and as students, become more uh, creative in our response to what people are, who we are, and what situations are because there, therein lies uh, so many solutions to our problems. And our trouble comes out of getting the attitude that it's us who are creating and uh, the idea that our plan has to prevail and we lose every time. Well, I've been too long and uh, I appreciate your attention and I hope that uh, I haven't sounded uh, prideful or in any way uh, concentrating on this work. I've only tried to give you an impression of uh, what is happening in, in just one uh, landscape architect's life. So thank you very much for your attention.